Hi, Dad Can here. Tonight I'm reading part one of the Magic Treehouse Super Edition number one, World at War 1944. Tonight's episode takes place on June 4th, 1944. Part two will deal with June 5th, 1944. But first, many viewers of these stories are not subscribed to my channel. Please take a moment to click the subscribe button below the video and the bell to be notified of new videos. For tonight's vocabulary, we look at the names given to both sides in World War II. The Allies consisted of many countries mainly fighting for freedom. They included the United States, Great Britain, the Soviet Union, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, India and many others. They fought the Axis powers consisting of Germany, Italy and Japan. Now let's find out how Jack and Annie get caught up in one of the most destructive events in world history. If you're sitting comfortably, let's begin. Chapter 1. Commando Jack! Annie shouted from the front yard. Jack looked up from his book. Tired from a soccer game, he was lying on his bed, reading about volcanoes on Mars. Late afternoon shadows stretched across his room. Jack! Jack! Jack stood up and crossed to the window. Annie was standing by her bike. A towel was draped around her neck. Her hair was wet from swimming in the lake. She was looking up at the sky, as if she was searching for something. What do you want? Jack called through the screen. Come down, she called. Help me look. Look for what? said Jack. Just come. You won't believe it, said Annie. Jack sighed. He marked his place in his book and went downstairs to the front porch. This better be good, he said. I was in the middle of a book. Annie was still looking up at the sky. Where did he go? she said. Where did who go? said Jack. Annie didn't answer. She walked to the edge of the yard and kept looking. Oh, darn, I don't see him. See who? said Jack. What are you talking about? The pigeon, said Annie. Jack stared at Annie for a moment. Seriously? he said. You're looking for a pigeon? Yes. You called me away from my book to see a pigeon, said Jack. Yes. Help me find him, Annie said. Jack rolled his eyes and stepped into the yard. He looked up at the hazy sky. He was following me. He swooped down near my head, said Annie, still looking in every direction. I don't see him now. Where could he have gone? What's the big deal, said Jack. We see pigeons every day. Not like this one, said Annie. When I was getting on my bike at the lake, I heard a loud cooing. I looked up. He was sitting on a branch, and he looked straight into my eyes. He was super intelligent, I could tell. Are you sure he went out in the sun too long? asked Jack. I'm serious, said Annie. He had these intense staring eyes. I talked to him, like I said, hi, and then he took off. I thought, okay, so much for that. But then I started riding home, and he flew right in front of me, right across my path. How do you know it was the same pigeon? asked Jack. I just know it. He circled above me all the way home, said Annie. He even swooped down a couple more times. But I don't see him now. I don't see him at all. Her voice trailed off as she looked up at the sky and around the yard. Well, that's enough pigeon hunting for me, said Jack. I'm heading back to my book. He turned to go inside. Ah, I see him, I see him, Annie whispered. Jack stopped. Where? There, Annie pointed to a plump pigeon perched on a bird feeder that was hanging from a maple tree. She stepped toward him. The pigeon didn't move. She stepped closer and closer. The bird still didn't move. Oh, wow, Jack. You won't believe this. I didn't see it until now. What? See what? said Jack. Oh, wow. Oh, wow, Annie whispered. Jack walked slowly toward Annie. When he reached the side, he stopped and stared at the bird too. It was an ordinary looking pigeon. Smoky grey with black stripes on his wings and iridescent green neck feathers. His amber coloured eyes stared at Jack. Look at his leg, Annie whispered. 
Attached to one of the pigeon's spindly legs was a tiny red canister. Whoa, whispered Jack. I think he's a carrier pigeon. A carrier pigeon, said Annie. Yeah, they carried messages to people a long time ago, said Jack. There used to be lots of them, but not any more. Why not? Annie asked. <laughs> They're not needed any more, said Jack. Not with technology like the internet and cell phones. The pigeon made a low cooing sound. Why did he follow you, said Jack? And where did he come from? Annie took a deep breath. I know where he came from. I just figured it out, she said. Where? Another time, said Annie. A time before the internet and cell phones. Jack's heart skipped a beat. You think? I know, said Annie. And the message is for us. She moved a step closer toward the pigeon. But the bird flapped his wings and took off from the feeder. Then he soared out of their yard and up the street, disappearing into the trees of the Frog Creek woods. Let's go, cried Annie. Wait, I'll get my pack. Jack bolted into the house, grabbed his pack pack from the hallway and hurried outside. Jack and Annie raced up the sidewalk. They crossed the street and ran into the woods. As they weaved in and out of dark green shadows, the late summer air smelled of sun-dried wood and fallen pine needles. Birds called lazily from the treetops. Finally, they stopped at the base of the tallest oak. Of course, said Annie. She grabbed the rope ladder that dangled from the treetop and started up. Jack followed, and they both scrambled inside the magic treehouse. Golden sunlight lit the stacks of books and the shimmering M on the floor. Of course, said Jack. A soft cooing sound came from the window. The carrier pigeon was pacing on the window sill. Of course a million times, said Annie, laughing. Don't fly away. I won't hurt you. I promise. The pigeon stopped pacing and stared at her with his amber eyes. I can take that message from you now, Annie whispered, if you don't mind. <laughs> he doesn't mind, said Jack. He's a professional. Right, said Annie. The pigeon was very still as Annie reached out and gently opened the lid of the red canister attached to his leg. She pulled out a tiny scroll. Then she snapped the lid shut and unrolled the piece of paper. Annie and Jack looked at the writing together. It wasn't elegant like Merlin's or Morgan Le Fay's writing. It was a scrawl of a kid's handwriting. Jack looked at the signature. It's from Teddy, he said. Uh-oh, said Annie. What happened? Did he goof up again? <laughs> I'll bet he did, said Jack. They both laughed. The apprentice sorcerer from Camelot often made them laugh. Sometimes he made big mistakes when he tried to do magic. Many of the mistakes were funny, but a few had been terrible. Annie read the letter aloud. Dear Jack and Annie, I sent Commando to find you. Commando, Jack interrupted. That's a funny name for a Camelot pigeon. Yeah, it sounds like a tough army guy, Annie said. She kept reading. Kathleen and I are working with the forces of good in one of the darkest hours of history, and we need your help. Please come to Glastonbury, England, right now. Your friend, Teddy. I can't wait to see Teddy and Kathleen, said Annie. Yeah, said Jack. He was especially excited to see Kathleen, a brilliant and beautiful young enchantress from Camelot. But what does Teddy mean, one of the darkest hours of history? Annie shrugged. The pigeon made a low cooing sound. Commander wants us to hurry, said Annie. OK, let's go, Jack said. He took another deep breath and pointed to the words Glastonbury, England on a tiny piece of paper. I wish we could go there. The wind started to blow. The treehouse started to spin. It spun faster and faster. Then everything was still, absolutely still. Chapter 2. Top Secret Commando cooed as if saying goodbye. Then he flapped his wings and flew out of the treehouse. He disappeared into the misty grey twilight. Thanks, Commando, Annie called after him. Well, I guess we're here, said Jack, shivering in the chilly air. But our clothes didn't change. I wonder why. The treehouse had landed in the branches of a tall maple tree. Through the haze, Jack could see ducks floating on a pond and sheep grazing in the meadow bordered by hedgerows. Beyond the hedges were broken-down buildings, 
stone pillars and crumbling archways. There was no sign of people. It looks ancient, said Annie. Is Glastonbury part of Camelot? I don't know, said Jack. This sort of looks like Camelot, said Annie. Yeah, the ruins of Camelot, said Jack. Teddy, Kathleen, Annie called. There was no answer. Let's go look for them, said Jack. Jack grabbed his backpack. He and Annie climbed down the rope ladder. They stepped onto the wet grass and started across the meadow. Rounding a hedge, they came upon the remains of what had once been a huge church. The roofless building had tall ivy-coloured walls and grand arches made of stone blocks. Cheerio, friends! A teenage boy strode through one of the arches. The boy wore an old-fashioned flight suit, gloves and a tight-fitting leather helmet. He carried a khaki duffel bag. Teddy! cried Annie. She and Jack hurried to the young enchanter of Camelot. Teddy put down his bag and they all hugged. I'm glad Commando found you, said Teddy. He's quite a smashing soldier, you know. Who? The pigeon? said Annie. Yes, Commando is a member of the National Pigeon Service, said Teddy. Jack and Annie giggled. <laughs> You're kidding, right? said Jack. Not at all, said Teddy. Pigeon breeders have given over 200,000 pigeons to the British military to carry messages throughout Europe. Commando has been on dozens of missions. The missions were all in this time, of course. He needed the treehouse to take him to your time. So what is this time? asked Jack. It's June 4th, 1944, said Teddy, and you have landed in Glastonbury, England. It's the site of one of the great monasteries of Europe. You can still see an ancient tower on the sacred hill of Glastonbury Tor. He pointed to a conical hill overlooking the flat countryside. Eventually all the sacred buildings fell into ruin, but legends of King Arthur still surround this area. For that reason, I thought it might be a good place to meet you, a living midpoint between our worlds. Where's Kathleen? asked Annie, looking around. We thought she'd be with you. Well, that is why I called for you, said Teddy. But first, how much do you know about World War Two? Jack gasped. Did we come to the time of World War Two? I'm afraid you have. The war has been going on for almost five years, said Teddy. Oh, man, said Jack. So you know about World War Two, said Teddy? Uh, some, said Jack. I know that America fought Germany and Italy and Japan. A man named Adolf Hitler was the leader of Germany, and his political party was called the Nazis. And we also know that three of our great-grandfathers fought in World War Two, said Annie. The people of England are grateful for all the help the Americans are giving them fighting this war, said Teddy. At this point, Nazis have taken over most of Europe. They've killed countless innocent civilians, including millions of Jewish people. That's terrible, said Annie. Really terrible, said Jack. But what does this war have to do with you and Kathleen? When Merlin looked into the future... He saw this frightful time, said Teddy, and he saw how important it was to bring hope to British leaders. So he sent Kathleen and me to London. The leaders actually met with you, asked Jack. Teddy smiled. Indeed they did, he said. Kathleen used a bit of magic to make us both appear older than we are. We were quite brilliant, wearing the right disguises and using the right manners and speech. We seemed to have inspired everyone, including the Prime Minister, Winston Churchill. Really, said Jack? Oh, yes, said Teddy. In fact, Winston inducted Kathleen and me into the SOE. What's that? asked Annie. SOE stands for Special Operations Executive, said Teddy. It's a top secret organization that Winston formed. It conducts undercover missions in countries occupied by the Nazis. In the short time since Kathleen and I completed the required training, we have both been sent on many secret assignments. Is Kathleen away on an assignment now? asked Annie. Yes, Kathleen left for a mission in France more than three weeks ago. And now? Teddy stopped. And now what? asked Jack. Now it seems she's disappeared, said Teddy. Oh no, what happened to her? asked Annie. I do not know, said Teddy. What was her mission? asked Jack. I do not know that either. She could not tell me, said Teddy. Secret agents must keep their mission secret even from each other. All I know is that two weeks ago I was asked to fly behind enemy lines to a location in Normandy, France to pick her up. Fly behind enemy lines, said Jack. Yes, I've done that many times, said Teddy. 
but when I arrived at the meeting place, she was not waiting for me. I was frantic, and then yesterday I received a message from her, delivered by a French carrier pigeon. So she's okay, asked Annie. Well, at least I know she's alive, said Teddy. The problem is, she wrote a message in a code, in case it fell into enemy hands. But I've had no success making sense of certain parts of it. He pulled a small piece of paper from his pocket and read Kathleen's message aloud. Come to me in the darkest time, a wand I need and a magic rhyme. Three miles east of Sir Kay's grave, cross a river to find a cave. Look for knights and small round cows, a crack in a rock beneath the boughs. Teddy sighed. You see why I cannot share this with anyone in the SOE, he said. Even if they could decipher the code, others would not understand her request for a wand and magic rhyme. But why does she need them, asked Jack. Her magic is amazing. Remember when she turned us all into seals? Yes, but these are very, very dark times, said Teddy. I'm not surprised that she may need extra magic. I found my own powers very limited. That's why I sent for you. So, do you have something we can take to Kathleen? asked Jack. Oh, yes, said Teddy. I have the wand of Deanthus and the rhyme to unlock its magic. Great, said Annie. The next two lines of her message I do understand, said Teddy. He read on. Three miles east of Sir Kay's grave, cross a river to find a cave. The secret burial places of Arthur's knights are revealed in one of Merlin's books, said Teddy. Kathleen knew I would know that the burial place for Sir Kay is Cannes, a town in Normandy, France. Wait, i better write this down, said Jack. He pulled his notebook and pencil out of his backpack. Spell that, please. C-A-E-N, said Teddy. Jack wrote the town's name in his notebook. So we go to Cannes, said Annie. We travel three miles east, cross a river, and look for a cave. Yes, said Teddy, but I cannot imagine what the next two lines could mean. He read from the note. Look for knights and small round cows, a crack in a rock beneath the boughs. Teddy looked up. Do you understand this? Not really, said Jack. There weren't any knights fighting in World War Two. Indeed not, said Teddy. And small round cows? A crack in a rock? Bows? What does that all mean? He folded the note and handed it to Annie. Well, I trust you to figure this out. I know you are expert decoders. You're kidding, said Jack. Us? Of course, said Teddy. When Kathleen and I went with you to New York City, you figured out the secret poem to free the unicorn from the museum tapestry, remember? And Morgan's missions for you were often written as riddles. Yes, but, started Jack, we have to find Kathleen, said Teddy. I cannot lose her. So many people have been lost in this terrible war. It really is the darkest time. A truly terrible time. It's okay, Teddy, Annie said. We'll help you. Of course we will, said Jack. We'll do our best. Teddy took a deep breath and smiled. Thank you, my friends, he said. I am most grateful and sorry that I cannot be with you in France. You're not coming with us, Jack asked. No. Tonight the SOE is sending me on an urgent mission to rescue downed airmen in Holland and Belgium, said Teddy. I must do so before daylight. Wow, said Annie. It is the sort of thing the SOE does every day, said Teddy. Then he clapped his hands together. All right, let us roll up our sleeves and get moving. It's time you put on your parachutes. Parachute, said Jack. Yes, said Teddy. You cannot jump from a plane without parachutes. He picked up his duffel bag and strode off. Wait, did he say we're going to jump from a plane? Jack asked Annie. He did, said Annie. But don't worry. He said he'd give us some magic. She hurried after Teddy. I know, but... began Jack. Come along, Jack, Teddy called to him. The moon is rising over Glastonbury Tor. Chapter 3 Spy Taxi A full moon glowed over Glastonbury Tor as Jack and Annie followed Teddy between the hedges. Moon shadows stretched along the ground. Teddy rounded a tall bush at the edge of the abbey grounds. There she is, he said. He pointed to a small plane sitting in an open field. Oh, man, said Jack. Is that real? He thought the tiny plane looked like a cartoon. A single propeller was attached to its rounded nose, and it had big, clunky tyres. Yes, we call it a spy tax, he said, Teddy. It was made especially for secret operations. 
It can fly low under enemy radar and land in tight places. How many people does it carry? asked Jack. It's designed to carry only a pilot and one passenger, said Teddy, but it also has room for supply canisters, which I'm not carrying, so one of you can take that space. But what about when we add Kathleen, said Annie? Do not worry, said Teddy. I think we can all squeeze together. And if that does not work, perhaps with the magic you bring her, Kathleen can make everyone fit. Good, said Jack. He was eager to get the wand of Deanthus from Teddy. And another question, where will you pick us up? In the same place I drop you off, said Teddy. I've been to that drop zone before. It's a lonely field, and to the best of our knowledge, not under enemy observation. You'll have to get back there from wherever you find Kathleen. Got it, said Annie. But an equally important question is when I will pick you up, said Teddy. And that is a question you will have to answer. How do we answer it, asked Annie. When you know it is time to leave, you must send me a secret message, said Teddy. By pigeon, asked Annie. No, a carrier pigeon might be difficult for you to find. It'd be easier to send a message over a wireless radio, said Teddy. What should our message say, asked Annie. In your message, say, Teddy thought for a moment, and then smiled. Say, the unicorn is free, and wait, wait, said Jack. He wrote in his notebook, the unicorn is free. And then add the date and time, said Teddy. Send that message over a wireless radio, and I'll pick you up at that time in the field where I drop you tonight. How do we find a wireless radio, asked Jack. As you go about your mission, be on the lookout for members of the French Resistance, said Teddy. Any one of them will help you find a wireless. What's the French Resistance, asked Annie. Throughout France, there are French citizens who are secretly fighting back against the Nazis who have occupied their country, Teddy explained. They're called resistance fighters. They live very dangerous lives. If a member of the resistance is caught by the Nazis, he or she will be imprisoned or killed. That's terrible, said Annie. So how do we find someone in the French resistance? Ah, there are many ways, said Teddy. The simplest way, though, is to make the V is for victory sign. He held up two fingers in the shape of a V. It's a secret way for one resistance fighter to recognize another. You can make the sign with your fingers. Draw it on a piece of paper, scratch it into the dirt, or signal any way you can. Jack and Annie both held fingers up in a V is for victory sign. Good, but be very careful, said Teddy. If you give the sign to the wrong person, you could end up in the hands of the enemy. Teddy reached into his large duffel bag and took out some clothes. These are your disguises, he said. He handed Jack and Annie each a pair of corduroy overalls and a long sleeve shirt. They pulled them on over their shorts and t-shirts. And these, said Teddy. He handed them each a pair of boots. They took off their sneakers and pulled on their boots. And a field pack instead of your backpack, said Teddy. He gave Jack an old-fashioned looking pack with buckles. You'll have to wear it on your chest. Your parachute will be on your back. Jack moved his notebook, pen and pencil from his backpack into the field pack. He left his backpack beside the sneakers. And now your flying gear, said Teddy. He took out two leather helmets and two pairs of goggles. Jack and Annie each pulled on a tight-fitting leather helmet. Then Jack positioned his goggles over his glasses. And a torchlight, said Teddy. He handed a large, heavy flashlight to Jack. Jack put the flashlight into the field pack. And now, Teddy climbed up a short step ladder to the door of the plane and pulled out two bulky contraptions. They looked like long canvas backpacks attached to a complicated web of straps and buckles. Your parachute harnesses, he said, descending the step ladder. Come on, I'll strap you in. One at a time, Teddy buckled Jack and Annie into their parachutes. Then he attached the field pack to the front of Jack's harness. So... How does all this work, said Jack, who was fighting to stay calm. Teddy pointed to a large metal ring on a strap across Jack's chest. This is your ripcord handle. When you pull it, it will release your parachute. OK, but when do we pull it, asked Jack. After you step off the plane, you'll plunge through the open air, said Teddy. Count to five, then pull hard on the handle. Easy? Easy? Jack felt a little sick already. Remember. Jump quickly, one after the other, Teddy said. If you do not, you'll land too far apart and lose each other completely. Got it, said Annie. 
And finally, said Teddy, he handed them each a printed card with a small photograph. Identity cards. You now have French names, Jean and Amy. Where did you get our photos? asked Jack. A tap of the wand helped with that, said Teddy. Cool, said Jack. He was relieved when he remembered they would have the wand of Deanthus. He thought their mission would be impossible without magic. Climb aboard, said Teddy. He scrambled up the step ladder. Annie bounded after him. Jack didn't know how she did it. The parachute equipment felt very heavy and clumsy to him. He climbed awkwardly into the plane after Teddy and Annie. Teddy was already sitting in the pilot seat, in front of a control panel. Position yourselves behind me, he said. Jack and Annie crouched in the narrow space behind the pilot's seat, squashed by their parachute gear. Remember, when you jump, face the earth, said Teddy. Arch your back, spread your arms out and count to five, then pull the ripcord handle. As you float down, keep your elbows close in, then roll onto your left side. Wait, wait, said Jack. Can you go over all that again? Easy, said Teddy. Eight simple steps. Hold on. I'll write them down, said Jack. He pulled out his notebook and pencil from the field pack. As Teddy gave the directions again, Jack wrote. 1. Legs together. 2. Face earth. 3. Arch back. 4. Spread arms. 5. Count to 5. 6. Pull ripcord. 7. Elbows in. 8. Roll to the left. Annie and Jack stared at the notebook, whispering the steps to themselves. Got it, said Annie. After you land, said Teddy, roll up your chutes and hide them. Hide your helmets and goggles too, and destroy your notes. Got it, said Annie. All right, said Teddy. Gas, oil. Jack peered around Teddy at the instrument panel. There were at least a dozen round gauges. Some monitored oil pressure, fuel pressure, and temperature. There were also compasses, brake controls, knobs, buttons, switches, and levers. Oh, man, thought Jack. You must have had a lot of training, he said to Teddy. Indeed, a full week, said Teddy. A week? That's all, said Jack. Yes, it was very intense, said Teddy, as he started flipping switches. They said I was a natural. Green lights lit up the panel. Needles swung right and left. Air intake control, Teddy announced. He turned a knob. It is much easier than learning magic. Jack felt a wave of panic. Teddy, slow down, he said. Engine start a button, Teddy shouted, pushing a button. Teddy, are you sure you know how to do this? Jack said. But his voice was drowned out by the sound of the engine as the propeller started to spin. The big wheels began rolling. The plane shook as it bumped over the grass. Then, rocking from side to side, the spy taxi lifted into the air. As the tiny cramped plane climbed higher into the moonlit night, Teddy pushed more buttons and pulled more levers and shouted out more information. His heart racing, Jack tried to focus on the eight steps. He whispered, Legs together, face earth, arch back, spread arms, count to five, pull ripcord, elbows in, roll to the left. What does that mean? Jack shook Annie's arm. What does number eight mean, he shouted. What? she yelled back. Number eight, shouted Jack, jabbing his finger at the list. Do you roll in the air or roll on the ground? I think on the ground, Annie answered. Jack nodded. That made sense. As the plane rumbled through the night, Jack whispered the instructions to himself again and again. We're crossing the English Channel, Teddy called. Normandy soon, and your dropping point. Get ready. Jack crammed his notebook and pencil back into his field pack. His fingers were trembling so much he had trouble buckling it. We are over France now, shouted Teddy. Oh no, murmured Jack. We're coming to the drop zone, cried Teddy. Get ready to jump. Jack froze with fear. Open the door, yelled Teddy. Jack couldn't move. Annie pulled up the latch, slid open the door, and crouched at the edge of the plane. With the door open, the roar of the engine and propellers was deafening. Jack looked down at the endless dark. No way I can jump, he thought. Not without magic help. Jack bolted upright. Oh no, we forgot to get the wand. Teddy! We need, Jack shouted. Teddy couldn't hear him. Jump, he yelled. Wait, magic for Kathleen, cried Jack. It was too late. Annie leaned out of the plane. She fell forward, arching her back and spreading out her arms. Teddy, the magic, cried Jack. Jump, Jack, Teddy yelled. Jack had no choice. He had to jump now, 
or he'd land far away from Annie, and they'd never find each other. Jack closed his eyes and hurled himself out of the plane, down into the moonlit, windless night. Chapter 4 Behind Enemy Lines Falling through the air, Jack forgot everything he had written down. He forgot. Legs together, face earth, arch back, spread arms, counter five. But miraculously, he remembered pull ripcord. Jack fumbled for the cord on his chest strap. He grabbed the metal ring and pulled hard. The parachute popped out from Jack's harness. As the chute's white canopy opened above Jack, it yanked him backward. The billowing silk slowed his downward plunge. Jack clutched his field pack as he drifted through the night air. The drone of the spy taxi engine faded into the distance. Teddy was gone. Not far away, Jack could see Annie in the moonlight floating to earth, too. Hi, she yelled to Jack. Jack was too amazed to answer. He was filled with a strange happiness as they both drifted in a dreamlike fall toward the field below. Suddenly, the earth rose up to meet him. Jack hit the ground with a thud and, remembering the eighth step, rolled onto his left side. He lay in the cold, damp grass, trying to catch his breath. We're in France! We did it! Annie called from nearby. She threw off her parachute harness and ran to Jack. We did it, he repeated, sitting up. His parachute lay spread on the ground behind him. We did it! Wasn't that fun? said Annie. Yeah, yeah, it was, said Jack in a daze. Jack wiggled out of his harness. Floating through the night sky actually had been fun, although he had no idea how he had done what he had just done. I have some bad news, though. What? asked Annie. Teddy forgot to give us the magic wand for Kathleen, said Jack. Oh, no, moaned Annie. Oh, no is right, said Jack. I guess it means we'll have to help Kathleen without magic, said Annie. But that's okay. We have lots of skills. Like what? Jack asked. Well, like, just lots of skills, said Annie. Don't worry. We can do this. Let's go. Hold on. We have to roll up our chutes and figure out where we are first, said Jack. He and Annie looked around. In the moonlight they could see trees bordering the field on three sides, and a road on the fourth side. A church with a tall white steeple was down the road. Let's take that road, said Annie. Yep, said Jack. That should work. But we have to hide the parachutes before we go. In the quiet night, Jack stood up and strapped his field pack on his back. He and Annie carefully rolled up the soft silk canopies of their parachutes. They gathered the straps and tangled cords in her arms, and started across the field. Hey, said Annie, stopping. I hear a plane. Teddy's back, said Jack. He remembered that he forgot to give us the magic wand and spell. Yay, said Annie. Wait, said Jack, squinting at the sky. Not just one plane, but three planes droned overhead. It's not Teddy, said Annie. Run, said Jack. As the planes dipped down over the field, Jack and Annie ran toward the road, lugging the bundles of their parachutes. Get down, Jack shouted. He pushed Annie into a ditch at the edge of the road. Clutching their gear, they lay in a thick bed of wet and rotting leaves. The planes roared off into the distance. After a long silence, Jack and Annie stood up. They're gone, Jack said. So what do we do now? Annie asked. We have to find that town, said Jack. He looked around at the moonlit dark. But we might have to wait for daylight to figure out how to get there. Jack saw the glare of car headlights coming up the road. Hide! cried Annie. They threw themselves face down again in the ditch. Jack held his breath as a car rumbled by. Soon all was quiet again, except for the distant barking of dogs. Jack and Annie lifted their heads. We have to get away from this road, said Jack, and find a place where we can stay hidden for a while. Remember, we're behind enemy lines. Nazis could be anywhere. Come on. Annie didn't say anything. She didn't move. Hey, are you okay? Jack asked her. No, I'm scared, Annie said in a whisper. You are, said Jack. He knelt beside her. Annie was never scared. He was always a scared one. This seems so dangerous, she said, hiding from Nazis. Jack was frightened too. She was right. Hiding from Nazis seemed much scarier than anything they'd done before. But if Annie was scared, he had to act brave. It's okay, he said. Think about what you told me earlier. 
We don't have magic, but we've got skills. And we've used our skills again and again in our missions, right? Right, said Annie. Well, we'll use them this time, said Jack. You think we can? asked Annie. I know we can, said Jack. First, we need to get to a safe spot. He pulled out his flashlight and pointed it toward the road. The light lit up a sign that said, Bierville. Not far down the road was the white church. Okay, Bierville, this is where Teddy will pick us up with Kathleen. Right, said Annie. The field near the sign that says Bierville, near the white church. See, we solved that, with our observation skills, said Jack. So now we'll head into the woods across the road and hide there until daylight. Okay, uh, that's the skill of uh, um, being smart, said Annie. She stood up. Let's bury our stuff here. Good idea, I've forgotten that, said Jack. See, skills, we got them. They buried their parachute gear under piles of leaves and brush. Don't forget these, said Jack. He pulled off his helmet and goggles and shoved them under the heap. Annie did the same. And my notes. Jack ripped his notes out of his notebook, tore them up, and hid the pieces with everything else. Okay, he said. Onward, let's go. With Annie close behind, Jack led the way across the road and into the woods. Tramping through tangled undergrowth, Jack and Annie made their way deeper into the moonlit forest. They didn't stop until they came to a wooden fence. When Jack pointed their flashlight toward the area beyond the fence, it shone on neat rows of vine-coloured trellises. Looks like a vineyard, he said. What's that? asked Annie. You know, where they grow grapes to make wine, said Jack. We shouldn't trespass. Before he could finish, Annie grabbed his arm. Listen! Jack listened. From the woods behind them came the sound of a dog barking. Then he heard men's voices. They're searching for us, said Annie. Trespass, said Jack. He turned off his flashlight and they scrambled over the wooden fence and took off running through the moonlit vineyard. They ran between the long rows of grapevines until they saw a small farmhouse ahead. Smoke was rising from the chimney. Not far from the house was a barn. The barking behind them was getting louder. It sounded as if the searchers had entered the vineyard and were heading their way. There, said Jack. He grabbed Annie's hand and pulled her toward the barn. Jack yanked open a wooden door and the two of them ran inside. Jack switched his flashlight back on and shined it around the barn. Horses stood in stalls, swishing their tails and munching hay. There, Annie pointed to a stack of hay bales in the back. They crouched together behind the bales. Jack turned off the flashlight and put it in his field pack. He and Annie waited motionless, huddled on the floor, inhaling hay dust and animal smells and trying to breathe as quietly as they could. The barking grew louder and closer. The horses moved restlessly. Jack heard men shouting above the barking, but he couldn't understand what they were saying. Then the door to the barn banged open. Fritz, check inside, a man said. Jack heard two sharp barks and the sound of a dog sniffing and scratching. The next thing he knew, a German shepherd bounded over the hay bales. With a low growl, it bared its teeth. It's okay, Annie whispered to the dog. It's okay. The dog snorted and sniffed their faces. Jack didn't move a muscle as Annie gently stroked the dog's head and whispered in its ear. The dog grew calm. Annie whispered again. The shepherd licked her face, then it barked once and loped out of the barn. Nothing in there, Fritz, the man said to the dog. Good boy. The door slammed shut. The men's voices faded away. Everything grew quiet. Jack and Annie waited a long moment. Then Jack let out his breath. What did you say to that police dog, he asked. Annie shrugged. I said, good dog, everything's okay, we're friends. I just didn't tell him whose friends we were. Jack shook his head in amazement. Let's escape while we can, said Annie. Jack was relieved. Annie sounded like her old self again. Calming the dog calmed her too, he thought. Okay, but let's go slowly. Just as Jack and Annie stood up, the door to the barn creaked open again. Jack's heart pounded as he dropped back behind the hay bales. The barn was lit with flickering lantern light. Jack heard footsteps on the wooden floor. The steps grew closer and closer. Then a man with a black beard peered over the hay bales. He wore a black beret slanted over one eye. Aha! We found you, 
he said in a deep growly whisper. Chapter 5. Resistance Jack was too terrified to speak. Annie slowly held up two fingers in a V is for victory sign. What is she doing? Jack thought wildly. We don't know who this guy is. The man glared at Annie for a moment. Then his craggy face broke into a smile, and he held up his fingers in a matching V. Oh, man, thought Jack. Did we really just find a member of the French resistance? Who are they, Gaston? A woman called from the barn doorway. Who are you? Gaston asked in a raspy voice. Jack stuttered, terrified. Jean and Ami, Annie said quickly. Annie's a good spy, Jack thought. He had completely forgotten their French names. Really, said the man. Are those your real names? Annie laughed. No, our real names are Jack and Annie. Oh, brother, Jack thought. She's a terrible spy. And what are Jack and Annie doing in our barn? asked Gaston. We're hiding from the Nazis, Annie said. Well then, said Gaston, you are in the right place. For the moment you are safe, children, said the woman, stepping forward. She wore a shawl around her shoulders and a kerchief over her dark hair. Hello, my dears. My name is Suzette, and this is my husband, Gaston. Nice to meet you, said Annie. Come with us. Back to our house, said Suzette. Jack and Annie climbed out from behind the hay bales and followed the French couple to the door of the barn. Before they left, Gaston blew out his lantern light. Silence, he ordered, until we get into the house. Gaston and Suzette led Jack and Annie through the dark to the front door of their small stone farmhouse. Once they were inside, Jack and Annie looked around the room. It had a low ceiling. Candles burned on a heavy wooden table. A fire flickered in the large fireplace. Suzette placed an iron bar over the front door, while Gaston closed the window shutters. Sit, children, said Suzette. We will have apple cider, and you will share our dinner. Jack and Annie sat at a table near the hearth. A pot hung over the fire. Jack relaxed a little as he smelled roasting potatoes, onions and carrots. Gaston poured cider into mugs, and Suzette prepared four bowls of stew. Then the couple joined Jack and Annie at the table. The fire crackled as they all quietly sipped cider and ate their dinner. When they were finished, Gaston leaned back in his chair and lit a pipe. You know, he said, when the Nazis were here earlier, they were not looking for you. They weren't, said Annie. No, they were looking for two paratroopers who had been spotted dropping into a field near here, said Gaston. Oh, then they were looking for us, said Jack. No, no. Gaston stopped and gave Jack a funny look. Unless you two could be those paratroopers. Yes, we could be, said Annie. But no, said Gaston. How could two children parachute into Normandy? And why? We're working with agents of the SOE, said Annie. But no, Gaston said again. Oh my, said Suzette. Are things so bad that children are being recruited as spies now? Well, we're not just any children, said Annie. We were asked because one of our best friends is an SOE agent. We have information that she is three miles east of Cannes. We're supposed to find her and get her out of France. Then you do not have far to go, said Gaston. We are only four miles northeast of Cannes. There is a great danger, though, said Suzette. The city is surrounded by Nazi patrols. You will need the right papers. We have identity cards, said Annie. Good, said Gaston, standing up. Come with me. We will hide you here tonight and help you get on your way in the morning. Thank you, said Jack, standing up with Annie. Thanks for the dinner, Annie said to Suzette. It is my pleasure to feed two brave children again, Suzette said. Why did she say again, Jack wondered. Come along, Gaston said, waving his arm. Jack and Annie followed him to a room off the kitchen. Gaston pulled aside a floor rug, revealing a trap door. He lifted the door and then, carrying a lantern, he led Jack and Annie down a staircase to a cellar. Hundreds of wine bottles sat in racks along the walls of the dank, musty room. Suzette will bring bedding, said Gaston, and you can keep the light with you. He placed the lantern on a long table, and then started back up the steps. Without looking back, he raised his hand. Good night, he said. Thank you, called Jack and Annie. When Gaston was gone, Annie sat down at the table. Wow! They saved us, she said. For now, said Jack. 
I wonder what these little rubber blocks are for, said Annie. She picked up a small block from the table and held it to the lantern light. Look, it has the letter H on it. Jack walked over to her. On the table were dozens of small rubber blocks and several stacks of paper. And this one has the letter S, said Annie, holding up another block. Here's a D, said Jack. S and U. They're all letters. It must be a printing set. Check this out, said Annie. She picked up a piece of paper from one of the stacks on the table. She showed it to Jack. He read the print on the page aloud. Hope and courage, freedom soon. Annie thumbed through more papers in the stack. They all say the same thing, she said. It's a bunch of flyers. Do you think Gaston and Suzette secretly passed them out? Here is your bedding, children, said Suzette, coming down the steps to the cellar. When she saw Annie holding one of the flyers, she stopped. Did you and Gaston print these? Annie asked. Suzette crossed the room and stood in the lantern light. No, we didn't, she said softly. Our sons did. Your sons? asked Annie. Our brave twins, Tom and Theo, said Suzette. They are couriers for the French resistance. What are couriers? asked Jack. Couriers travel on bicycles, delivering messages from one resistance group to another, said Suzette. Tom and Theo also printed flyers to give people hope. On their courier routes, they sometimes posted them when no one was looking. Only, one day, someone was looking. What happened? asked Annie. Three months ago, we received word that Tom and Theo were picked up in Paris by the Nazis, said Suzette. So, they're in prison now? asked Annie. Suzette took a deep breath. We do not know what has happened to them, she said. I'm sorry, said Annie. Are Tom and Theo children? They are young men. Twenty-two years old, said Suzette, but they will always be our children. Are you and Gaston in the French resistance too? asked Jack. Suzette nodded. Our job is to gather and send information, she turned away from them. But now my job is to make your beds. We'll help, said Annie. She and Jack helped Suzette spread the threadbare blankets on the floor. I fear you will not be so comfortable, said Suzette, but at least you will be safe. That's all that matters, said Jack. Thank you, Suzette, said Annie, and she hugged the kind Frenchwoman. Try to sleep now, children, said Suzette. You will need all your strength tomorrow to find your friend. Then she climbed the stairs and closed the door to the cellar. That's so sad about their boy, said Annie. Yeah, said Jack. He didn't know what else to say. He was amazed by the courage of Gaston and Suzette. Even after their sons were caught, the couple were still willing to risk their lives to help others. So, tomorrow we head to Cannes, said Annie. Jack nodded. Do you have Kathleen's message? Annie pulled a piece of paper from her pocket and read aloud. Come to me in the darkest time, a wand I need and a magic rhyme. Three miles east of Sir Kay's grave, cross a river to find a cave. Look for knights and small round cows, a crack in a rock beneath the boughs. So we figured out the first four lines, said Annie. We know Kathleen needs magic, which Teddy forgot to give us. Right, said Jack. And we know we have to go three miles east of a town named Can, and then cross a river to find a cave. Right, said Annie. And then the weird part. She reread. Look for knights and small round cows, a crack in a rock beneath the boughs. Jack shook his head. His brain was getting foggy. Let's ask Gaston and Suzette in the morning if they have any ideas, he said. Good plan, said Annie. They pulled off their boots and lay down on the ragged blankets. We'll figure it all out tomorrow, Annie murmured. Yeah, right now. I'm way too tired, said Jack, closing his eyes. He was exhausted from travelling through time to Glastonbury, flying over the English Channel, parachuting into Normandy, running from planes, lying in a ditch, hiding in a barn, escaping Nazis and making friends with people in the French resistance, all between twilight and bedtime. That's all for this time, but before we go, I'd like to give a big thank you to Jonathan. I'm very glad you enjoy the videos. Next time, I'll be reading part two of World at War. We'll find out what happens to Jack and Annie when they wake up on June 5th, 1944. That'll be next time on Dad Can. Thank you and Good night. What you to dream? I want you to dream. I want you to dream.
dream.